Hey, welcome everybody to uh, another Parsons TKO event. Um, we're just gonna uh, get started here in just a second. So we thank you all for joining us. And we're excited today to welcome you to a discussion of the power of utilizing data to increase engagement and how that relates to the future of nonprofit data. And I'm really thankful to be here. I'm uh, your host, Nate Parsons, um, co-founder of Parsons TKO. Um, we're a digital transformation agency that focuses on helping organizations um, use technology process and empowering their staff to advance their missions more fully in this digital age. And we do a lot of work around business process improvement, technology road mapping and planning, and all sorts of other things that help organizations actually enable themselves to use technology, not just acquire it. And uh, I'm really thankful today to be uh, joined by two illustrious experts in the data field. And uh, we'll start off with uh, Mina Das, and I'll, I'll let her introduce herself. Thank you for joining us, Mina. Yeah. Thanks, Nate. Thanks, Stefan, for having me. Um, how do I introduce myself? Every time I try this in a new way, in a new experiment. So these days, I would say, today, I would say, I am the one who reads really good books like Living in Data and then turns them, the, those things that I learn into consulting and workshopping on advancing equity through data or how do we build better donor engagement with inclusion in mind. So my focus, the focus of my work um, as an independent consultant for Namaste Data is to always involve data with social equity. And that is what I'm doing these days. Very good. And I am Stefan Bird Kruger. I am the head of data strategy at Parsons TKO. Um, and uh, building on, on Nate's introduction of the company, my role in particular is to help our clients leverage data as a strategic asset, uh, really helping them understand the value of their data both as, uh, as something that drives their engagement and drives their relationships with their audience, but also something that's uh, much more internally reflective, something that helps organizations understand how their own staff are relating to their work, how their staff are relating to their tools, their technology, their audiences, um, and really as a, as, a, as a way to build a culture um, that is curious and, and, uh, and inclusive um, of uh, people's ideas of, about how to drive the mission forward. Um, so really excited to uh, to be here and especially to talk with you, Mina. Uh, I know it's uh, it's been very fun um, reflecting with you and learning about your approach uh, to, to data in the sector. Uh, looking forward to this conversation very much. Me too. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm excited too. And, and as you can imagine, um, our, what we're going to do today is have a little bit of a guided discussion where we hope to have a, a little bit of free form engagement and kind of engage in different things. But we do have some topics we're going to work through to sort of really get at the heart of these questions. Um, but we encourage you to participate in this conversation as well. We have um, the Zoom chat open and, you know, our team is going to be watching that and I'm going to be trying to watch it too so that we can surface those questions and, enter, you know, uh, bring them into the conversation at the right places. And so please, if you have uh, questions, you have thoughts that are spurred from what you're hearing, Please uh, feel uh, like this is a participatory uh, interactive event. And we'd, we'd love to hear your thoughts in the chat. So um, thank you for that. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll dive in. And so, um, you know, Mina, you know, I think we'll start with you. You know, you've been a prolific publisher on LinkedIn and you have a fascinating um, sort of quote unquote origin story a little bit about how you built your network and started to like use data to actually you know, um, build your own community and to have actually really personal relations. And I think that's sort of a counterintuitive thing to a lot of people. Um, and you built a really large following and, you know, you have this sort of very archetype of personalized engagement that scale on social media. And so, you know, I think it'd be really valuable for people just to hear a little bit about what you've learned, not just about how to do that process, but what your audience cared about and how you actually kind of moved from the analytical data side of min-maxing to personal relationships and really building things that and connections that your audience cares about and that you care about? Well, thanks for that good question. Even during the prep and when, when I saw this question, it came to my mind, okay, these folks really think I'm doing something super great, but <laughs> that's not necessarily um, true. I'm doing it with a lot of amazing people like yourself. So the, the question I... I see it in two ways, in two parts. One is what does my audience care? And the other part is how did I do it? How am I doing this thing? And I would say um, to the first part, how am I doing this? How am I bringing a audience? It started almost like two years ago when we all you know, were sort of grounded by the planet. Stay, at, stay in your room, don't talk to anybody, don't go outside. And 
I started to show up on LinkedIn more because that was that was a place where um, I felt comfortable. Um, TikTok is not my thing, and Instagram is also not my thing, and making quick videos of dancing and jumping. So I decided, okay, I like to write good content and good posts, and I want to show up on LinkedIn. And I started to show up. And um, believe it or not, my first way to show up was not about writing posts. It was just about, can I talk to one other human being who nods to me, who says, yes, I understand you. Yes, I see you. And I started to reach out and create space for um, having these conversations, coffee conversations, almost every Friday one to three coffee conversations every Friday. And that happened for a little while until I felt a comfort to start writing, to start posting almost every other week. Um, but to your other question, what does my audience care about? And a part of me always wants to write about mental health, always wants to write about social justice. But at some point I started to see, okay, I want to talk more about humanizing analytics. I want to talk more about humanizing data, humanizing um, the AI that we are quickly moving towards. Um, and not necessarily everybody in my audience already has the, that understanding, that passion for. And so part of my work and showing up in LinkedIn and building that audience and building that engagement has been about how do I do that? How do I humanize it? How do I create that curiosity? How do I create that um, level of questions that I can get it back in return? Um, what does this mean? And so I have had some of those. Now my coffee conversations have moved from, oh, it was a tough Monday to more like, okay, what does it mean when we put together this question with this kind of data? One or two questions. And that to me feels first indicator that I'm creating an audience on these topics um, that's happening. The other, other um, um, interesting way I'm seeing my audience is talking about these, this is, so for example, if Nate, you and Stephen, you are, let's say um, two people who do not know each other and are subscribers to my newsletters, I'm seeing this, this conversation happening between the two of you, Stephen and Nate about data equity without me in the middle. So I feel like I am connecting two dots who were not connected otherwise now and talking about this. And this feels like another good outcome of the audience. And you know, I, I know this question was for Mina, but I wanna answer it too. As, as one of Mina's audience members, uh, I, can, I can attest to what I liked. Um, I, I think the authenticity of your outreach um, the, the humanity of it. I mean, you are a person who talks about data and you do it in such an open, sort of transparent, relatable way. You talk about the experience of working with data. Um, even, uh, I think one of the first posts uh, that where we started actually talking to each other, you were just talking about the process that you go through to have these conversations. I mean, it's just so open and relatable. Um, and and I really, I, I liked that and I love seeing it in the data space where we default to talking about the technology so much. We always think of it as it's bits and numbers and it's tools and tech, um, but it's not. Like data is about the way we relate with our systems. It's the way we relate with uh, with evidence of our work. Um, and uh, and yeah, I think just the, the space you're able to create around data for people to talk about the way they work, the way they feel about it. Um, yeah, I think it's wonderful. It's an it's a, it's a example of uh, what we should all aspire to. No, I, I actually remember the post you, you are talking yeah. about. Um, no, that reminds me. So I was doing this experiment last year. I wanted what I am trying to teach in my consulting and in my workshops. I wanted to practice that. And so I took all my um, LinkedIn connections as an experiment, like they are my prospects, they are my donors, and now I want to create a relationship with them. But how do I do that? I have these 9,000 people in my network, something that comes up even when I'm giving it to fundraisers, Here, here's your segmented list. But how do I help them to create meaningful relationships from there? So I think that was the post about it. And you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, humanizing data is it can be approached in multiple ways. And I wanted to approach it in a way to not just talk about data, to not just talk about technology, but as someone 
who also who has her own bad days who has her own um non-working days sad days you know strange days and i'm i still want to next day next day wake up and work with data and how do i bring both the elements of good and the bad days into data as someone who is working and then creating narratives out of it and then taking that context out of it and sharing that with the stakeholders so i cannot keep away the emotions to re reduce it to 95 percent out of this five out of 15 there has to be emotions in it so yeah i'm trying to do that Oh, I love it. Yeah. And I think, you know, you know, one of the, the things that you sort of subtly, uh, you know, demonstrated there is like in terms of expertise that I, I just wanted to highlight for a lot of people is that, you know, a lot of people start out with data being a two way conversation. Like there's an organization and there's a consumer of, of content or whatever, or donor, any of those things. But what you've done is made at least a three way or a multi way conversation, a community conversation where it's not just you and another person and that's the data that you're thinking about it's actually interconnectivity and like what do people in your network need to know about each other in order to have connections not just what do you need to know about them in order to like talk to them about consulting or whatnot and you know i think that's sort of a really powerful thing and it's a sophisticated thing and you know i think that kind of leads into my next question which is you know what do you think leadership looks like in the context of, of data in the nonprofit sector where you know, I think a lot of nonprofits power or, you know, at least their potential power is through these connections they make and that they bring people together and they coordinate, you know, a lot of people to do good. You know, what do you what do you think leadership with data is going to look like in the future? See, that's what I'm working on. If only I knew all the things that my work is going to <laughs> our work is going to bring forward. Well, see. So I have I have been working in the industry for and when I say industry, I come from tech and I moved to nonprofit and I have been working for almost 15 years now. A lot of my work before in the tech has been as um, program managers, as someone who created has to create dashboards, has to create KPIs, metrics. And I moved to nonprofit. The work has been similar on um, analyze data for engagement, do these surveys. And there have been different lenses when I have had to apply okay, this is this project, this is this work that I'm doing. For the first time in this doing this consulting, I want to throw all of those lenses of man, program manager, of, of building KPIs and metrics. I want to go back to the fundamentals. And, and I'll come to the part where what does leadership look like? And I'm leading up to that, I promise. Um, but I want to I wanna take a hundred steps back to the fundamental of data because I truly believe that it's like having a relationship in the kitchen. And I have talked about this example with Stefan before in our conversations, and I think of it, you too, Nate. Um, a lot of us have, not everybody in the family has some relationship with the kitchen. That's one space where everybody has a relationship with. Some are cooks in my family. Some would get groceries and just, you know, stock the fridge. I am more of a fridge reader, nothing else. And then there are some who do it all. Um, but everybody has some relationship. Data is the same thing. Everybody has a relationship. Someone, someone collects it, someone visualizes it, someone analyzes it. The leadership is the one who may be looking at some reports to create strategies and uh, making decisions and next steps, but everybody's doing something with it. And so the leadership as of now, if the question is, what is its relationship with data? To me, it looks like right now, it's very specific to, okay, give me a report here. We'll get together in a room and we'll talk about the next steps. What I want, where I want this um, consciousness and awakening to happen is asking, okay, where's this data coming from? Who collected it? Why did we collect it? Let's talk three more fundamentals so the next steps and strategies that we create is truly um, inclusive that we want it to be. It's truly equitable that we want it to be. And to make that happen, I want the leadership to look like who ask those fundamental questions. What, what do you think, Stephen? I mean, I love the analogy. We're talking about farm to table data. Um, and I think that is, uh, I think that's spot on. I, you know, leadership, there's a lot of room for leadership. Um, there's a lot of room for, for innovation and innovating on the way we use data. Um, and I think that the, the first place to continue with the analogy, um, the first step that I'm usually talking people to get to 
is, is just getting everyone at the table. You know, leadership is setting that table. Leadership is making sure everyone understands their relationship to the family of data. Um, and and I, I like what you're saying, which is you go a step further, which is we don't just come there to be consumers of it. Um, although, although you know, I, I will say there, there are serendipitous conversations that happen at the data dinner table. Um, and so not trying to be too prescriptive has its own benefit. Um, just let your team be natural. Um, but I think while we're there taking a moment, um, uh, again, continue with the analogy, you know, a moment to say, say grace, uh, you know, around our data and appreciate where it comes from, appreciate its heritage, appreciate the relationship to the audience, to what it represents, um, to what it takes to gather this data, why we have it, what's the point of it. Um, I think I think having those, those sort of reflective conversations about your data practice are super, super valuable and changes the way people feel about the data that they're working with. It makes it more meaningful, more relevant, more delicious. Um, and so so, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I think that's exactly the right approach. And, and I would I would want to add there. Um, it's not just about the leadership themselves, right? Like if yeah. they would obviously they would have better relationship with data, that's good, but they are also the ones, like you said, are setting the culture. Yes, and so this exactly. constant, um, give me fresh data, give me new data, it creates a culture of or our expectations for the data collectors or the um, evaluators or the, the people who analyze, okay, let me create this new report, send it, let me create this next report and send it. There is no time in building that culture. Where is the curiosity about that data? Yeah. Where is the um, general feeling, okay, what am I doing with this data? It's not just about answering a question that is being asked to the data. So yeah, yeah. I think to quote you, yes, that's the grace that we are talking about that we can do. Exactly. Yeah, and leadership does not always come from the top. I think it can come from anywhere in the organization, any side of the table. Um, yeah, I think it's exactly right. I'll throw out one, um, one hope I have for uh, nonprofit leadership and their relationship to data in the future, which is that, you know, to, to take the kitchen analogy, I think there is a need, especially as people are collecting more data and getting more sophisticated in the use of data, for leadership to say, that's enough. And what I mean by that is like, we've washed enough dishes, we need to do something else in the kitchen, or <laughs> this fridge is stocked with enough, you know, uh, you know, eggplant for the moment, we need something else now, you know, like, I think that as leaders get more sophisticated in what they're looking at, they can help the data collectors and the data operators and the data experts within the organization know when they've got enough, right? Because, you know, in our own business, I can tell you that sometimes I need to know things down to like a second decimal level. And a lot of times I just need to know, is it a big thing or is it a small thing? And like, you know, those are totally different in the data world. And I think that, you know, it's often difficult for people to know what their leadership needs and the leaders because of their lack of expertise and knowledge and comfort with data as a subject often say, Give me the very best thing you possibly can, regardless of how much effort, reality, or anything else needs to be bended in order to make that actually happen. You know, I think as as nonprofits get more sophisticated, they'll know the right fidelity of data to ask for, and that's going to make the kitchen a lot happier place to be in a lot of ways. I think. Yeah, you know? I mean, actually, I give an example. I think two weeks ago to one of my clients, I said, "Okay, so this person, this particular individual, is becoming." is um, in personal life is becoming more healthier. And so I used to ask these questions about, okay, where, what are you doing in the kitchen? So I could use the kitchen example more. <laughs> and um, he's becoming healthier. And, and uh, you know, in a way he's bringing more choices of good food in the kitchen. And so I gave him this example that, okay, what, what do we do when for the first time we are looking at our fridge and we want to, okay, let's get some of this, fatty stuff out and let, let's pack it with organic stuff. Let's bring some good veggies. Let's bring, that's the first level of your data cleaning. You have some bad data, clean it up, you get some good data, but you cannot stop with too many organic veggies because that's not good either, right? You can't have just endless carrots and endless peas in your fridge. They're you need to rock. have a balance, yeah. <laughs> right? And so the next question then is, how do you know how many, how much veggies do you want to stock up? How, how do you know how many, um, organic uh, milk cans you need? And that's a very day-to-day -day question. It doesn't need us to take another webinar or another conference to learn how much food do I need in my fridge or how many vegetables I need in my fridge. We can take the same feeling, the same emotion, the same understanding and same awareness and bring it to data. 
clean yeah. it up and then decide what do we need to do with it. So it doesn't yeah. mean, in a way, we, we do know what are the things that are good, going to be good. We just need a little bit more consciousness and clarity and purpose within our own self. Absolutely right. And I want to latch on to that word purpose. Uh, you know, I um, also a very recent client conversation where they're um, uh, looking to move to a new CRM and they are coming to it with so much complexity, so much data that they've collected over the years and all these different formats from all these different contexts. And the weight of that, the weight of that complexity is, is it's, it's truly holding them down and holding them back. Um, and and they, they have, have this feeling that we need to keep this. We need to somehow preserve every bit, every line, every name that was ever entered and all the context from it. Um, and that need is actually preventing them from moving forward. Um, it's causing them so much stress that you know they can't even really work with it. Um, and there, there comes a point where you have to do that cost benefit analysis. Like the potential benefit of this data that's preventing you from acting is not good enough for you to keep it. Um, and so really we're figuring out when it's time to clean out the fridge, um, you know, what can we call and what we retain, what is the purpose of that? And that I think that word of purpose is central it's to so many things. I mean, not, not least of which is compliance. Um, you know, with all the data privacy laws out there, having purpose for your data is critically important to legally have that data. Um, but I think beyond beyond that, it is the the question of what is the role of the data in our organization. You know, I often say data by itself has no value. Um, mm -hmm. Data is gets its value through its adoption, through its use, through us looking at it, thinking about it, having conversations at the dinner table about it. Um, and so I think um, just, yeah, having, having that purpose and using that purpose to guide both our operations on data, but even the very architecture, the very, um, you know, the inventory of what we track and what we keep uh, and what we get rid of, uh, so important to, to figure out what you wanna get rid of as well. Yeah, these are really good points, I mean, it's making me think about change moments in general. You know, we uh, just did a, a big, uh, you know, educational push on how Google Analytics 4 is going to change the, you know, access to data and the kind of data that a lot of nonprofits are able to get their hands on and, you know, what a big shift it's going to be. And we're also seeing quite a few organizations in the marketplace moving off of Luminate and um, last year, this year, and next year, and you know, trying to figure out what's next for them. And you know, Stephanie, you're just talking about a big project where people had a lot of legacy data and spreadsheets and other things, and are trying to figure out how to squish it into a new system. Um, you know, That's with all. change in the air, I mean, you know, both here in technology and in the profit land, and you know, in America and the world more, more broadly, you know, what's what's new that people should be aware of? What what other ingredients are coming into the fold that you know people need to plan for as they're kind of trying to manage this change moment? Like, you know, are there other new things that are entering the mission-driven space? I think Stefan, do you want to take this first? Because I'm probably gonna go a rabbit hole and rant. So I'm gonna <laughs> let you give an articulation. I will. I know what rabbit hole you're gonna go down, so I want to make sure <laughs> I'm not in it. Um I you know, I think in terms of what's what's new in the space, um uh, again, I mean, I mean, sort of hinging off of what we've been talking about, the newness is a little bit about technology. There's lots of new technology. And I think um, things like the Google Analytics 4 transition will change what's possible, you know, um, for, for better and for worse, uh, I think, uh, at times. Um, because when you change things like with the Google Analytics example in particular, Google Analytics 3 is going away. The nonprofit sector has a huge amount of experience with that tool, that platform. Um, and it's getting completely upended. You know, they're going to a whole new world. This has a very real implication. So I think the technology changing matters. It introduces possibilities. Google Analytics 4 can be built into all kinds of new and modern and creative and advanced solutions. Um, but, but I think all of that, whether it's good or bad or which one's right for you, it all comes down, down to the day-to-day -day experience. Um, what is our relationship with these tools? Um, and so I, you know, when I talk about new in the nonprofit sector, I, I kind of don't want to focus on the tools of the technology and the dis disciplines, knowing that AI is out there, knowing that you can use machine learning. It's really, it's cool. It's very exciting. Lots of new things are possible. I like looking at it because it helps us brainstorm the things we would do if we had that. That's valuable. Um, but that act of brainstorming, I think, is worth more than the actual tool and technology. Because the things you imagine, there are lots of pathways to achieve that. Um, and so I don't want people to get too hung up on the tool. I want them to focus on the, 
what could I do if I had data like this or if I you know, operated it in that way? Nina, I tried to stay out of rabbit holes. Let me get out of your way. You did a good job. You did a good job. Um, I, I would I would agree. I agree with you what you just said, Stephen. And I'm, I'm going to add that with a little bit more of a fundamentalist ethicist lens to say, going back to the kitchen, would it matter if I prepare chicken with a new spoon, with a different looking spoon, with a different uh, looking dish, would it matter if I serve it on a white plate versus a, a flowery plate? Because those are the things that I'm translating it into work. They are the tools. That's the technology that's enabling you to do your primary job of cooking and not cooking and probably hungry. It's not Audience cooking, engagement. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but doing your job with data, it's the primary thing. And so um, when it comes to has, asking this question, what's new in data, I almost want to immediately say there is nothing new about data. This, this data is it's fundamental, it's old. It's almost like, you know, this is one of my, and I, I said this before, this is one of my pet peeves, is I don't want to use 100 fire emojis around the word data, new data, boom, boom, boom. No, it's, it's, it's old. It's about, it's about people. It's about the things we are engaging with that matters to us and the data we have been collecting it exists already. So anything new that I would want to see amongst us about data is just the better consciousness and better understanding and purpose of what we are doing with it. And I know I have picked this book in front of you guys even before the call, but this is a great book, Living in Data. And, and I'm, I'm learning a ton of stuff from that book. One of the things that I'm learning specifically is we have come, come to a place where 95% feels bigger than the number five. There was, a, there was a page I was reading last night where the sentence was, we have come to a place where 95% feels bigger than number five. Nobody's asking how 95%, okay, uh, what does it, where is it coming from? What is it? What does 95% represent? Out of how many? Five, what does that represent? Out of many? But we just automatically placed so much value just on the number itself or the, um, just those little, digits that we are missing where we are coming into those conversations and what's coming out of those conversations. So uh, anything to new, I would just go back and say like, we need more understanding. Where is it coming from? The, the purpose maybe, I'll stick to that word. Oh, I, yeah, I think you're, you're, fun, you're totally right. I mean, there's certain things that are just sort of err and fundamental. And I think data is one of those things, but um. You know, I will say one of the things that I see, you know, to answer my own question here a little bit in the space is related to something I, I learned at the very beginning of my career, and these things seem to be cyclical, but the first book I read about data really outside of like my physics, you know, background, um, you know, like about like engagement data and things was this book called Peopleware, which was, uh, you know, the, a book about managing knowledge workers, and these guys had done these incredible long in investigative surveys at the big companies, figuring out what made people productive and what pe made people unproductive. And, you know, in, in the technology world, one of the things that developers were always trying to help leadership understand was this idea of the mythical man month, that if a project took two months and you added four more workers, that didn't mean it now took two weeks, right? What it really meant is that maybe took three months because those four people actually didn't add velocity just as like, you know, as like putting more gas in the tank or adding more, you know, batteries to something, well, you know, like it actually doesn't work that way, you know? And it was really trying to help leadership understand like how data worked and how knowledge workers worked in relation to that data. And, you know, one of the things that we're seeing industry wide right now is the consolidation of marketing and outreach teams and fund uh, development and fundraising and grant giving teams together. And that there are people are realizing that that data isn't different, right? It's actually the same data, just used different ways and often informed and improved by connecting those two people's views and understanding of that data together. And in fact, one of our clients, um, you know, recently had their title changed from like, I think it was like VP of comms or something like that to VP of engagement. And, you know, we wanted to give ourselves a little pat on the bat as the engagement architects, but I think it's actually an industry, you know, trend more widely, you know, that that's coming together. And I think in a lot of ways, what I see is the new thing in the nonprofit space and the mission driven space is a better understanding of the kind of data they have, you know, not that the data is different or that there's new tools or new software for the data. It's that their relationship to the data is new. And I think that's really 
an important fundamental shift in the sector that I hope continues because it's so meaningful when you think about the first time somebody is met to a point where they might put you in their planned giving or their will or something like that. And that's a long relationship often, you know, and in most organizations um, still, there's a big, you know, sort of firebreak that, you know, somehow that data and that relationship has to jump inside the organization, if the, even if the person outside wants to have a, a building and continuing and deepening relationship. So, you know, I do think the relationship with data is maybe is what's new as much as any, like, you know, fancy widget or whatnot in the space, at least for, for what I could see, you know. Now, those long surveys made, you mentioned it, it reminded me as you we were talking about my, my previous and all those jobs where those really long surveys would land in my inbox, you know, or, or I would be the one talking to those teams who would be sending out the surveys. And, and I think at this point, and I, and I say this, my work is evolving, I am learning, so I am evolving, and I'm, I'm sure we all are. And from the point when I used to do those jobs as compared to now, I see big problems with those long surveys that just ask for, if we add four more people, this is going to bring up the operational efficiency to this match or the, it's almost like we are taking people as like units in that data, like, you know, but the problem is it doesn't, it doesn't differentiate between, let's say, for example, access needs. They are not just units who are the same. It's not having four oranges of exact same size, weight, shape, and adding it to your juice. It's like four different four different people there. They, they, their access needs to be different. And I'm giving one example of how that's one of the problems where we cannot assume that I am going to be the same way productive as Stefan, you are going to be, as me, you are going to be, if the three of us are added into a project. And we need to, as, as managers, as leaders, we need to be aware of what my team needs. And sometimes those standardized surveys have those problems. So I'm probably went tangential, but I just, those surveys reminded me. Yeah. I don't know. I, this is all rings very true to me. And Mina, your example before of the 95% is bigger than five um, uh, made me wince and brought me back to my own, you know, when I was young in my career and an analyst sort of responding to requests from people all over the organization. Um, one of my favorite, um, favorite and most common questions I got was, can you give me, um, you know, can you tell me about this campaign that we ran or this, you know, social media push that we're doing? Um, just the numbers. I just need the numbers. Um, and it's such a ludicrous question, such a ludicrous request. Um, and, and it rings so, it, it rings hollow and it, it speaks to the relationship that people have with data right now. Um, because when you're doing that, you know what you know what's happening with it. It is going into a report, maybe a spreadsheet or something. It's checking a bureaucratic box, and it's not being used what it's meant for, which is to help people understand the relationship with their audiences. Um, and I think that's the fundamental thing. And and and, um, and it's it's e so easy to do this. I think with social media data in particular, because there is so much of it, um, and the format that it gets delivered to us in. And social media data, you think about the dashboards that you can log into, you think about the, the roll-up reports and things like that. It's very easy to just get that top line number. How many likes, how many followers, how many posts? Um, um, it's very well structured to spit that out. Um, but, and, and I'll actually give those dashboards some of this credit. Um, people often look past that, that roll-up screen. You know, the here are your five best performing posts. Um, it's very easy to gloss past that because, okay, well, I don't want to know about the top five. I want to know about all of them. Give me the top line numbers. But there's so much value in digging into that. There's so much value in just opening up those posts, just scrolling through the comments and seeing what people are actually saying. Um, and this is something, you know, the, the numbers with no context are, are meaningless. Um, and the best thing we can do when we're trying to talk about analytics is bring along the anec data. Um, you know, give me an example of what these numbers look like, what they represent, actually show me. And I think when people, um, you know, just a recent post I put up was about how um, data without UX is, is pointless. Um, when you actually think about the experiences that you're creating for your audiences, when you look at these numbers, it transforms how you interpret them, it transforms what you understand about them, and it transforms what you will decide to do next. Um, it just makes, it puts your brain in a creative space as well when you're thinking about you user experience. So doing that, adding that context, actually visualizing what the data represents um, 
in a real world way, not even just from a data visualization perspective, um, is uh, I, I think I think that's a uh, that's new, <laughs> and uh, and leadership. And I think it connects back to the question number two that we had. Um, what does leadership look like with this new data, right? Like so. So the example that you mentioned, it kind of brings and to our topic of today's to engagement, that, that's the expectation leadership sets. This example that you gave just now, your leadership would ask for these, just the numbers, the high level numbers, and you as a new analyst would produce them and share them. That creates an expectation for the new analysts, right? That, oh, my leadership wants these, so probably good leadership looks like this. So I should do the same when I am moving forward and becoming a leader, I'm gonna ask those same numbers. It's setting up that, it's, it's like a cycle and we want to break it, break that kind of a cycle. Um, and I think that what looks new in the leadership should too, setting up the, con setting up the culture. I think these are so such wise things and you know, it reminds me of a, you know, sort of funny, but sort of related story um, for back in my past. So, you know, a uh, little in fact, I used to work in the travel and tourism industry and I'd had a lot of connections with people who did social media campaigns for big brands and things. And um, one of my friends went on to work for the agent, an agency that managed uh, one of the big three automakers social media accounts and, you know, things were popping along and then they had this uh, particular week where their engagement was off the charts and everyone was like really excited. And then what they found out was was that um, you know, in uh, the context of uh, that's uh, of looking at that data, somebody had forgotten to log out on their phone of the corporate account and had tweeted something about how terrible Detroit's roads were, and that had like really soured this big three automakers relationship with the current government of Detroit. Um, but people thought it was hilarious that one of the big three automakers was trashing the roads in Detroit. On the on the report, it looked great. It looked like they were having a great social media week. In reality, it was a terrible week and people end up getting fired over it. And that's just a good example of like data without context can be uh, very dangerous, you know, and you can lead to a lot of erroneous conclusions, you know. <laughs> yeah, and maybe that's, that's a good segue to another kind of thing that I think about a lot, which is, you know, as we get more facile data, as people get more involved with data, you know, there are more concerns about sort of both data privacy and equity, you know, because I think one of the challenges with data um, especially social media data and things like that, is that it can be really non-representative of the populations that you wish you were reaching or the community you wish you had, right? I mean, there's all sorts of things, just free time, access to that, like, you know, the cost of the devices, the cost of plans, like where people have those things, the time of day you're interacting with people versus the time of day people use those devices. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that you can introduce bias or just misrepresent or get a different pie slice of the people you're trying to, like, really have a good community and come conversation with. So I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, just some of your experiences and thoughts around like, you know, both, um, you know, the access and management of data and, you know, to make it in a responsible way that kind of, you know, ensures everybody's privacy and, you know, you know, it has sort of an ethical bent to it, but also the sort of, acts, uh, you know, focus of how do we make data really, you know, mean what we think it means when we say 60% or 30% of something is happening, like, is it the right 30%? Like, how do we kind of, you know, manage that from an equity and a kind of diversity perspective? Oh, it's a very, it's a, it's a question I could probably write an article on. I'll take this down question for my next newsletter edition. Um, I'll share one thought and let probably Stefan chime in and then come back again. Um, Privacy and equity. When I read this question, and I was thinking, how should I respond to this question? Because it's it's a it's a broad topic. It's 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 tough and it's big and it's challenging question, and we are all dealing with this. And one statement or that came out of my observation was there are two different things. So, so privacy and equity. We, we know we are familiar with the word data privacy. We have seen it, whether or not how much we understand or not, we are familiar with the word. Equity with data is a sort of a new word. We haven't seen that much. So the way I have observed this in my conversations and in my work is we think, and when I say we, I say sort of like all of us in the in world, we think data privacy has 15 different ways to think about, but we understand none. For equity, we think about there's probably just one some magical way, which I don't know today, but I'll learn it from how to in one of the conferences and then I'll implement it and then it will be done. Neither is true. The, the, the understanding we need has to be in 
the smallest portion of how the data is collected to all the way up to how it's going to be used, how it's going to be leveraged, who is going to use it. There, I think we often circle these questions because almost with a hidden intention of, can I get a how-to? And there is no how-to. We have to use and ask these questions every step of the work. For me, my work looks like doing, let's say, um, let's say a donor engagement survey. It has to look like from the point of view of designing questions, sending it out, the settings to the analysis, to the reports, to how that is going to plug back in when into the strategies. Every point has some portion of equity in, in, included in it. Um, yeah, I'm gonna form more thoughts. Stefan, chime in, please. I mean, no, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I, I think it, it speaks very much to my perspective on this, the, the equity in your data reflects the equity in your strategy. Um, your data is a reflection of the strategy. And I think it comes back to that point of what is the understanding the purpose of your data, understanding why you're collecting these things, um, uh, what kinds of decisions you're gonna make with them. What is the point of tracking this? What is the point of, of studying it, of analyzing it? Um, and, and that is, that's going to roll all the way back to how you collect the data, whether it be a survey or passively on your website or in your email system. Um, if you want to be able to manage to various aspects of equity, you need to know that very early on because you need to build your tracking of that equity into the way you collect your data. Um, so that means including things like questions about identity in your survey or in your, uh, your event registration form. Um, because if you want to ensure that your population is representative of the population you intend to reach, you, you, need, you need to know that. You know, so often people will come to a campaign at the end and say, tell me about how equitable it was. And all you have is, well, this many people wanted lunch, you know, chose fish over the, the chicken. Um, you know, if, if you don't know and you don't plan to manage around that, you're just not going to have the right information in order to manage around that. Um, so it does. It, I think it, it starts very early um, in the process um, before you even get to the data in order for the data to be able to be useful in that. And I think that, that that point of purpose is also relevant from a privacy perspective, um, because if we are dealing with things that are often sensitive information about people, um, you need to recognize that. You need to recognize that sensitivity and figure out from the purpose, how do I limit when do I know it's time to delete the data that I've collected, that sensitive information about people? Um, when do I know, how do I know who needs this and make sure that nobody else has access to this data? Um, and, and, and really making sure that um, our, our data management practices align to that purpose and, and nothing more. Um, and so, so I think, I think those, are, those are my perspectives there. No, I and I would I would add there what, what you just mentioned and stuff and like and this I think came out of one of my con very recent conversations um this this social identity data like we were talking about something why don't we well why don't we include it in our data collection and send it out you know all these standard seven eight questions but it doesn't work that way it doesn't work because this person I was talking to um they're responsible for collecting data for their institution and they are being asked for from their leadership to collect this social identity data. And I think this is where we were talking about just adding those eight questions and then creating reports and saying five out of 15 people who responded to so-and-so race or ethnicity or sexual orientation said this, and so we should do this. That can cause more harm if we don't dig deeper because, um, and one of the things I, I recommended, and I think we all could, wherever the social identity data has been collected, we could do is let's start tracking how much data we are not collecting in those questions. Let's start tracking, because that talks about trust, that talks about the back to the privacy thing. So if, um, say, I'm a trans woman, and I, I, I've seen the harms that have been going on in the world, and all of a sudden I get a survey that asks me question to um, share my identity, which is so personal to me, and I have no clue why you are collecting it, how it would be used, 
I am not going to give you that information, no matter how many, how well in a language you put that and ask that question. And now it's on you as an institution, I would suggest start tracking how many years have you asked and not got back this response. So I have not got it back. My data quality was 40% on social identity today. Next year, it's going to be um, 38%. The year after, it's going to be 35 The lower it is, the better it shows you are creating trust, an environment of trust, so I can share something that's so personal to me. But just looking at what we have collected and not tracking what we have not collected can also cause harm. Absolutely, absolutely. I, and, and this gets back to, I think, Nate, your very early point, which is all of this work that we're doing, all of the work around data, around audience engagement, are relationships. Um, I think, uh, Nate, when you first said it, uh, you know, you said it's not just a, a two-way relationship, um, but it's also a relationship between peers. Um, I think I think we're lucky if we even get to the two-way relationship part. So many organizations just think, you know, I am I'm a, a press release machine. You know, I'm just pushing out content. Um, they're so inwardly focused um, about how they engage with their audiences. And Mina, your point about that is, if you're collecting data, be clear about why you're collecting it to yourselves, but also to your audience. You know, let's talk to our people. If you're going to ask about social identity, explain to them why you're asking how it benefits them for them to share this information um, and, and what you're going to do with it. You know, are you going to keep it forever? You know, are you going to report to your board about my identity? Um, you know, these are things that are relevant to people when you're, when you're engaging in these sensitive topics. Um, and, and I think that kind of transparency, that clarity, um, and, and doing it in a way that is authentic and approachable, um, you know, it's not enough to put it in your privacy policy and, you know, your terms and conditions, um, have a conversation with your audience, help them, bring them along in what you're trying to do. Um, I think, yeah, authenticity. Now, yeah, and this may be a kind of an inarticulate, like, you know, not a, not a very articulated way thought that's coming to my mind is, and I've seen this before, I think we need more grace and patience in the way we create our goals. So let's say we got, I, I created a post on behalf of a company on a social media page and that, that track going back to that tracking engagement on social media. Oh, I got like um, 15 good comments and uh, 200 likes, but no, we were actually hoping for 600 likes because that's what usually otherwise would happen in let's say other organizations. Or um, I think that's, that's a problematic place too even though we have had some idea about why we are collecting data, how we are collecting data, unless we also keep some grace and patience with you know, seeing the results. And so the moment you see only 200 likes and you say, oh, this is not working. This, you know, this idea of bringing equity and doing it is not working. Let me go back to how things were working and let me take back the approach. That's not gonna be helpful. So we need to have um, a little bit of a patience on what we are doing, trusting this process because it's about including people. It's, it's making sure that it's not just about categorizing and segmenting and then you know being extractive about it and then sharing back that information. So there, there needs to be some, I suppose, grace and patience in how we see those numbers. I can totally agree. I mean, yeah, it reminds me a little bit of, of one of the other things here is that, you know, language is so important and data is something that can help us improve our, our, our ability to communicate, like, both, you know, how we do it, the format, but actually even the language we use. I mean, you know, we focus a lot on the think tank industry and they are like a poster child for terrible language choices where, you know, they'll often have academic experts with PhDs talking to other PhDs who have been working on a subject for seven years, write a post that they want the general public to understand the importance and value of. And there's an enormous gulf between the language they're using, the technical terms, the way that they slice and dice nuance in the, you know, the language they use, and a reader's ability to even comprehend why they chose word A over B and the importance of that choice, you know, like that there's such a big gulf there. And, you know, there's another thing that sort of more broadly happens in the nonprofit community sometimes, like this term Latinx, which is, you know, has terrible polling that most Latinos do not want to be referred to as Latinx. And yet many people like to use it because they feel like it makes them progressive or that it's like the right terminology and people will come around or something like that. And, you know, those things all create barriers to actual equity, right? Because if you have you know, value you're trying to impart to someone or you want someone to support something you think will be valuable for the community or for the world, 
you have to meet in the middle and to have a good communication and really understand each other and listen to each other. And, you know, I do think that's a really important part of data, which is to like help people inside the organization rethink and hopefully reimagine how they're communicating, you know, and I think that's something I really hope data will help do more in the future, which is to get people off their communications high horses and get more to a like practical, reasonable place where they're just like, what do we need to do to communicate this in a way that really resonates? And how can we be, you know, empathetic and really listen when people are telling us they're not getting it, um, even if it's through sort of anonymous data sometimes, you know, and I think that's, that's, you know, one of my little hobby horses for the nonprofit sector, which is like, be practical about your language you know and I, I do think data has a, an opportunity to help with that yeah absolutely I remember you know when my first um in my first college when I was doing my first degree um one of my courses were marketing and statistics and I remember one of our projects back in and this was back in India one of our projects was um and and generally because the, the country speaks both Hindi and English so Hindi is the official language and English is taught in a lot of schools um, we were told because you can speak two languages, pick any movie, any cartoon, any show that and see the translate, watch the translated version and tell me how do you feel and tell because we were talking about the language statistics and marketing class and that was part of our project. And I think I picked up with my couple of my classmates, Nickelodeon or something like that to see the translated version. Um, from English to Hindi and the same version back in English to compare what how it seems. And it missed a lot of context. It sucked, honestly, and I'm sorry for the language, it sucked. Um, and that's when it was one of the, the learnings for that project was language really matters. And if you're translating something from A to B, B to C, ensure that the context stays. It's not just about using a voiceover in that case or taking a word and then using it in that, that, that other, another language. There are nuances because of which that language shaped up to be what it is. And so we need to, to save and protect that nuances in whatever the context is. We are putting that forward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a poem in one language doesn't translate in a machine way to a poem in another language. And there's poetry, there's poetry in a lot of our work. There's poetry in the way we write. There's poetry in your data. Um, and, and I think, yeah, that context makes all the difference. Wonderful point. Such a good point. Um, goodness. Yeah, so I guess um, we're, we're nearing the top of the hour here. So I know folks may have other places they need to run to, but um, are there any uh, other questions folks have from the field that they might want us to address? Or I don't know, um, uh, Mina or Stefan, if you have any, any thoughts spurred from this that you know we haven't sort of like uh, dove into that you wanted to kind of wrap up with, but um, yes. Stefan, you have yeah. any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to hear from the audience if, uh, if anyone wants to share, but you know, I think my parting thoughts, Mina, are just thank you so much for taking the time to, mm -hmm. to speak with us and mm -hmm. sort of share your ideas. Um, you know, when it comes to social media, social engagement, authenticity, purpose to the way you reach out to people, um, you've, you've demonstrated so much of what we talk about. Um, you really practice what you preach. Uh, and I, I respect what you've built, I respect what you've done tremendously. Mm -hmm. um, so I really appreciate the, this opportunity to, to sort of hear and, and connect ourselves to you and your good work. Um, it, it means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, no, the, it was the first time we have had that coffee and I'm so thankful that I wrote that post and we got connected. Yeah. <laughs> and since then, every engagement I have had with Carson CKO or with Nate Yu in our conversations with Stefan Yu, I mean, I really appreciate this. It, it's not every day I find spaces where what I'm talking about comes back with like nods that make sense. Yep, I'm, I'm, I'm getting it. I can see those nods here. So I really appreciate being here in this space. It's my pleasure. You saved me a cup of coffee from waking up because I had a good conversation. So. <laughs> Uh, well, we're really glad to have had, um, had you here, and, and Stefan, I'm very thankful for you as well, and, uh, and this has been a really illuminating conversation for me, so, so thank you so much for, for, for being here and for spending your time with us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, um, a recording of this will be available soon, and um, uh, I think Nikki has some follow-ups uh, for us if uh, folks would want to um, you know, connect with you, Mina, or read some of our blog posts on the subject or anything like that, but um, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. We appreciate it. Yeah, there's our little 
little place to connect folks to. Um, yeah, and thanks. If you have any questions for us, um, we're available after this. And you know, um, uh, Mina is a prolific poster, and we try and uh, you know keep up with at least a fourth of her volume on our own posting and stuff. So um, you know, if you have any questions after this, send them our way, and I'm sure those will uh, make their way into an answer somewhere. So thank you so much, everybody. Yeah. Awesome. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.